agenda. We've got decision papers on items four through six, though members will note that, um, sorry, put an echo there. Um, members will will note that um, there, uh, there was an email that I sent out uh, late afternoon yesterday that is, is proposing a, a bit of a different direction on item uh, four, which is the coastal plan. Um, so we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, there has been uh, some supplementary emails uh, that councillors have received. There was on the 27th of April, um, the agenda plus the coastal plan separate attachment. On the 27th of April, the table of amendments. The 29th of April, um, further uh, information regarding the national environmental or environment standard for fresh water and the relationship to the draft plan. And then yesterday there were responses to councillor questions and the email uh, from myself. Uh, so there's there's a bit of supplementary uh, information that everybody's got. Um, so hopefully we're we're across that. OK, so the idea is that we'll get through um, the aim is to get through item five, which is the coastal occupation charges, then take a, a bit of a break. Hopefully that's going to happen around 11 o'clock. And we are looking to conclude looking to around 1 p.m. All right, all going according to plan. So, uh, so any apologies? There are no apologies because we've got everybody in the. Sure. All right. I'd like to confirm the agenda, Madam Chair. Um, do we need to? We need to accept the apologies first. Would you like to do that? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, and a second for the apologies, uh, Councillor Husband. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. All right. Confirmation of the agenda. Councilor Remington. Yes. A second. Councilor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Disclosures of interest. Any disclosures of interest for, uh, that are not already on the register or are pertinent to any particular agenda item today? Nope. All right. OK, so we'll move on to our first big <coughs> which is item four, the consultative draft for the Waikato Regional Coastal Plan. So uh, the draft itself was sent out separately to, uh, to councillors. And in the agenda, we are on page five. All right. Now, as I um, uh, said, I sent out an email late yesterday afternoon, uh, you know, I, it, there has been uh, quite a lot of dialogue around this item. Oh, please go ahead and take a seat. Uh, there's been um, uh, quite a lot of, of interest in dialogue and, and rightly so. We have been uh, working on this uh, as a collective group of counselors for about a year and a half and staff much longer than that. Uh, obviously, um, ensuring that we have a coastal plan that uh, that achieves the objectives for uh, for ratepayers, for the environment, for um, for all those interested uh, is is our our top priority, and this is a significant piece of work. We want to make sure we get it right. And um, and while we like to move things along, and we have had thirteen workshops, I do get a sense that there's some. There's some additional questions and points of clarifications that the counselors need to feel um, comfortable going forward. And it's better that we do a, a good job, a great job, hopefully, than to rush something through when people are not quite comfortable with it. I'd like to see um, I'd like to see a plan that that suits this region uh, going forward. And considering that it's been 25 years you know, what's uh, if, if we're delaying for another six weeks to make sure that we're getting it right, I think that that's the best way forward. Um, yes. I agree with you, Madam Chair. It's a, it's a, it's a balancing act to uh, get it through in this triennial. I think, uh, triennial, I think 
we do. Uh, over the years, I've watched where a new council picks it up and you really start again, and uh, as if you've kind of wasted the whole three years. So it may not be perfect what uh, the outcome, but I think we just keep our kind of a foot on the pedal, even if it means uh, extra uh, uh, meetings to accommodate that. But it would be good to use the word of Sir Edmund Hillary, it would be good to knock the bastard off. And uh, I think you've got a full team that is absolutely supporting you on this. Yeah. It won't be perfect, but we're going to try and make it as perfect as we possibly can. It's part of uh, our CEO's KPI. And with your chairmanship, I know we're going to get to the finishing line. So, thank you, Councillor Remington. All right. Um, so, Councillor White, have you got? Yeah. Um, look, I, I, I just want to thank you for, um, for for raising the issue that you know, 25 years in the making, and and we do want it to be as good as it as it possibly can. Um, I also just wanted um, it to be considered that if we do get to um, when we get to the stage of doing a round the table robin of what everybody's issues are, I I would greatly appreciate it if you um, would consider um, inviting Councillor Lichtbach to the table um, to be able to raise the issues which he has on that particular agenda, this particular agenda item. Uh, only because I think that um, he has a huge amount of knowledge in terms of Whangaroa Harbour. It's a very important area. Um, and and I, I think it is important for us to all hear um, what he has to say, but for us to be able to take those, um, those, those things into consideration. So I would really appreciate it if you, um, if you would invite him to the, the table for that, just for that particular round the table discussion when we get to that point. And, um, I, and I, you know, I'd like to know what other people think about the suggestion as well. Thanks. Um, Councillor uh, Lichwork is not a member of this uh, committee, uh, as is the decision of council at this point. And um, as the chair, it is uh, it's over to me as to whether or not I extend speaking rights. I will not be extending speaking rights to Councillor Lichwork uh, for this meeting today. We have, uh, and, you know, with at my request and with my uh, blessing, I have extended many opportunities to um, to Councillor Lichwark to be involved all through this for the last um, 18 months that we have been working on on this this piece of work. Uh, even though that coincided with um, Councillor Lichwark's suspension from this committee, I have extended him through through um, Tracy and, and the staff the opportunity to to be fully involved in this process and he has certainly as, as everybody receives the councillor email alerts there have been um, opportunities for him to communicate his his issues with the, the wider councillor group so um, yeah so that would be my ruling today but thank you for raising that Kathy um, Point of, point of order, Chair. Sorry? Um, I, I want to speak in support of what Councillor White said because you and I have sit around enough board tables out of here to know that we make better quality decisions when we listen to the opinion of the people around the board table. I know this is not a board table, I know this is politics, but here's the thing. Every time I go and pick up the phone and talk to Councillor Lichwark, I get a different insight into this plan. So I think we should support Cathy's request for him at least to be able to come and sit at the table and give us a view. And and I have given my ruling on that. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. Did you need to, did you have a point that you no, wanted to? Are they using the mic? Oh, sorry, I think I'm sorry. Hilda. Just on the matter, um, if Councillor Lichwark cannot participate in forums prior to the council decision, I reserve the right for five middle to be spoken about then, which will delay the decision. So this this is a little bit pointless. I just want to know when will the input for five middle specifically, because I know that spreads particular um, skill set. It'll happen at the end, and we'll have to delay the end. So I seek your leave as chair to consider how we finish the process with. Uh, that input, not notwithstanding the matter um, that Katharina is dealing with with Fred, I just want to know when that harbour gets to be spoken for, because it was Tangata Whenua that asked for the same thing, 
And if it's going to be at the final decision meeting, I see that as a little bit pointless and, and delay, delaying. So again, it doesn't have to be answered to now, but somewhere between now and we end the coastal plan, I need to know, I want to be satisfied because some of them are my constituents that that expert view has been put in, that it's been taken into account and that I know what it is as a councillor. Because if I agree with it, I want to advocate for it. But I won't know that now until the final decision on this plan. And I don't think that's good enough. Um, what, and notwithstanding that, if it's if it's meant that another matter is causing this plan issue, then that other matter has to be sorted. Sorry about it, but the plan is more important than two people. Yeah, because this lasts like 20 years beyond us. So I need that resolved. Otherwise, I'm not sure how we finish this plan and, and its wholeness. Notwithstanding that, then as other people have matters to be resolved, but we can do that. We're, we're allowed to participate. So I just want clarity, not right now, Pamela, but before the end of the process, we will have to know. Otherwise, I can add another month on to your date. Yeah, and that's when it will happen. So kia ora. So just to reiterate, um, all along, as we have had uh, workshops as a strategy and policy committee, there have been workshops with Councillor Litchwark. So he has been able to provide input and reflect the, the um, concerns, the needs of Whangaroa and, and provide that additional. And I understand that. And, and so I perhaps, Molly, if you would like to um, make any sort of uh, comment from democracy with regards to, to opportunity to, to hear that, um, Councillor Litchwork's view. Sure, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I think is that on? Now. A few points have already been um, expressed um, by the comments that have been made by the few speakers um, that have already spoken on this particular kaupapa. Essentially, what you're asking for is, um, I guess, confidence that uh, Councillor Litchwark will have the opportunity to influence what is reflected in the draft coastal plan uh, before a final decision on the matter is made at full council. Uh, because currently that is his um, formal opportunity for input. Um, we're saying the same things because uh, the chair has expressed that there will be other mechanisms prior to that formal process for Councillor Litchwark to contribute. Um, but what potentially is missing and what might be helpful is a um, articulation or a clarification as to how the feedback that has been get gathered so far from Councillor Litchwark is reflected in the plan that will help Council to move forward with regard to finalising that plan and I guess give everybody the confidence, including Councillor Litchwark, that um, his contribution has been heard and is reflected in how that is reflected. So is that helpful? Um, so perhaps the next step for staff beyond today's meeting is to yeah um, articulate um, the mechanisms that um, Councillor Litchwark has been given to contribute and how his feedback is reflected before we get to the final council meeting to approve the draft. All right, I have made a, a, a ruling on the request, but is there any is there something you would like? I just to... want a point of clarification, Kathy. So, Cathy, you're not talking about today's meeting, are you? You're talking about the workshop that the chair's referred to that happens after this workshop. Is that what you're talking about? That free can take part in that, so that'll leave Tipper's concern as well, that the council, because I guess we do need to know that, that that's been heard. Is that what you're saying? So I, I was actually asking whether he could come to the table in this, meeting oh, in this meeting for this particular oh, okay. um, agenda item. But if that isn't possible, what I would like is that there is a <coughs> workshop where we actually all get to engage and hear what Fred is saying um, so that we understand it and we can actually debate it and we can properly understand what's what's going on. Because I, I do feel that he has a knowledge that I've kind of missed out on. And I'm, and I'm very grateful actually that, um, that the chair did Enable the um, and enable the sessions um, with staff between Fred and staff. I'm glad that that happened, but I do think that it, we still have missed out on the on the interaction 
and then the knowledge that we could have gleaned about Fred's particular area, but also um, the background and experience that he's got. And so I would like to just make sure that it's going to happen somewhere, that we all get to actually interact on this particular topic. So, so just to be um, clear, uh, Councillor Lichwark's participation in workshops or any um, uh, membership and committee is uh, sits with the decision of council. It does not sit with this committee. So this committee doesn't have any jurisdiction to uh, require what it is you're asking for. Um, that's a decision of council. So that sits with the chair of council. All right. So with that, um, so what I had proposed in in the email um, last night was that uh, was that staff would give uh, an overview of the draft that's that's currently before the committee, highlighting um, highlighting the changes from the March draft. Uh, they'll take us through the queries that have been received uh, so far and the responses and staff will highlight the implications of the national environmental standard on fresh water, including the legal comments that have been sent to us. Um, and then we'll we'll go around the room and uh, ask counselors for their comment and and input and and really, you know, like like Councillor Remington was saying, we do we do want to to bring this to um, a robust conclusion, uh, but we do want to give it the adequate space and time. So I, I do hope that counselors will take the, the time and the opportunity today uh, to put the, the, thing, the final things on the table so we can get this to a good place um, by the June meeting of strategy and policy. So just looking for um, an endorsement from the, the committee that you're happy with that way forward today. Just looking around the room, looking to see if I'm seeing any nods. Yes, Councillor McPherson. Um, no, I'm not happy with that. For the point is, as Kathy has said, I, as Fred talks, it affects my opinion. So I'm not going to be in a position of signing off on this plan until we've had fulsome and robust debate with Fred so we can challenge and ask why he's... And I have, Councillor years. McPherson, I have made a ruling on that today with regards to this meeting. And I have articulated that this committee cannot make any uh, commitments with regards to Councillor White's request that you're um, indicating support of. This committee cannot do that. It doesn't sit with this committee. So we'll move on now. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. All right. So with that, we have... You want to crack in? Yeah, awesome. that's possible. Um, Morning, councillors uh, from us. Uh, we have, uh, I would like a couple of introductory comments, but we have David Fazakli here. Uh, you may not recognise David uh, without his mask or sitting behind a screen, but David has been through uh, the council workshops with ourselves and also in the council workshops with ourselves and uh, Councillor Litchwark. And we have Bruce, who is our manager of policy. We have some of the team online who are recuperating uh, from being ill or are working at home today, but part of the, the coastal team. Um, a couple of things in an in introduction that I would, would like to say, um, and the chair has pretty much said the majority of it, but the, the draft is the culmination of um, a good three years work. I uh, went back over my calendar the last couple of years and I managed to uh, identify it's quite close to 80 hours of conversations through workshops. Now some of those, uh, the, the front end of our workshops are basically bringing everyone up to a level and an understanding of the, the statutory framework that we're operating under. Um, you will recollect at every uh, presentation we had an inverted pyramid that talked about our obligations that the plan must be crafted under, the test that it must be crafted under. And um, so that was kind of the first part of the workshops. The second part of the workshop has been focused on seeking policy directions. Um, I guess there's also been a hell of a lot of work prior to 
uh, the last couple of years. And that is, Bruce, I asked Bruce to bring as a, a visual aid the existing regional coastal plan because I'm pretty sure there are a few people who have picked it up and looked at it. Um, it's all online now, so probably not many people have that. But it is dated, it is old. Um, we have amassed probably over the last 10 years what was always known as Bruce's Red Book, but a hard-covered book of all the matters that had been identified that required addressing. And a lot of those have been identified either through conversations with IWI, with territorial authorities, with our consent planners, or people who have come in and wanted to go through the document. Um, we've also captured, and we're in the middle of a maelstrom of, um, reform that's gone on and captured those directions that we must look at. The purpose of a consultative draft is to get it out there. We um, previously identified for councillors who those targeted stakeholders would be to see how the, the document hangs together. It is new. It's a new document that has been developed under the National Planning Standards. So that is a new, a new way, a new resource management document. The plan that uh, Bruce has got there used to have a lot of explanation in it, a lot of reasons. Uh, that has been stripped out. So it's really to test with those people who use the plan a lot. Does it hang together well? Has it got everything in there you'd expect to see? Um, having that explanatory text removed from the plan, does that help or hinder your understanding? Um, appreciating the number of emails that have flown around in the last few days and the, the email that the chair sent last night. Um, we are here with open ears. Um, we appreciate those councillors who have sent um, questions to us and we have responded to those. Um, but we are here today to listen. Um, I understand that the, there is a, a recommendation to defer the decision um, to bring that to the next committee, um, but we've already had a signal of some actions that need to happen in the interim. I, I have worked through a potential timeline um, so that we can have workshops, get that feedback, incorporate that feedback and have it all together in the agenda so we're not having these um, multiplicity of emails that are flapping around with all these um, different bits and pieces. So it is all in that one composite agenda. Um, so I have worked out a bit of a timeline as the um, chair indicated in her email she would be after from us. Um, look, we have had tension in the, I have maintained tension and momentum in the system. A delay will likely mean that we won't have the document wrapped up in a final form as we had wanted uh, before the end of the triennium. But as I've talked about with the team, you know, we've got we've got to get this right. It is our one opportunity to get it right. Um, it would be uh, wonderful for all involved to complete the document uh, and the process and have a document ready for notification. But um, it is unlikely that will be possible. But we'll have something that is pretty pretty near ready or as ready as we will get um, with the direction that's set for us. So. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I appreciate Council's desire to take the time and further refine some things. Um, I appreciate wanting to hear from people. We do listen. Um, we do hear you. We don't necessarily take on board or can't take on board and make happen through the Coastal Plan what you may seek individually. But as a whole, we will incorporate that into the document into a document in as far as we're able. Um, and we'll have that discussion that we have had today. So, Madam Chair, we do have a couple of slides. I will pass over to David and Bruce uh, to present those. And then um, we will listen to feedback. Uh, just Madam, Madam Chair, it does disturb me to hear uh, what Director May is just uh, explaining that it uh, won't be completed at the end of this training. Uh, I, I think that's a mistake. I believe we should actually have as many uh, meetings or workshops as we need to get this over the line before the end of um, September. Um, 
I can promise you that you'll be undoing the very good work that's been done with a balance of uh, councillors from different views and uh, a new council, and I think there'll be quite a new council, will actually want to start the whole process again. That's democracy, but it's not efficient democracy. I believe there comes a time where you've got to put a line in the sand and it may not be perfect, but it's as good at that point in, in time as you're going to get. So I really uh, put my strongest feelings uh, to you, Madam Chair, and to uh, Tracy, and to Chris, that this document be concluded. It still goes out for draft. That's the kind of the back, the, the, the checklist. It still goes out for community comment. But for heaven's sake, let's get the show on the road and not delay it, because I can tell you now, it won't see the light for another two years. And it's only the draft. Thank you, um, <coughs> Councillor Remington. Madam yes. Chair, if I can just clarify, we will definitely have the draft complete by then. It is the decision to formally notify the plan that I don't believe we will be in a position to achieve by September. So I, I just want to clarify that for members. And also just one thing I didn't mention on all my bullet points is that the, the document has been through, as we've noted in the agenda, the first of two legal reviews, um, with the first legal review uh, really seeking legal endorsement around appropriateness for undertaking draft consultation. Um, the lawyers uh, felt uh, Simpson Grace and felt as though the document it is at an appropriate level for draft consultation um, from a technical perspective. Um, but I do just want to reiterate that this is this is the draft process we're dealing with now, not the formal proposed document which will come uh, somewhat later. Madam Chair. And that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Kia ora. Um, Councillor Nibban. Uh, thank you. I just want to clarify. Um, look, I, I think it's a good point. It would be ideal if we could get it notified before the triennium ends. It's all down to read through the whole of the stuff with the new council. Um, is, is it this extra month between now and the next Stratton poll meeting that's effectively going to push us over the end of the triennium, Tracy? I've got you noted, um, Councillor Tag is the next speaker. If you're, if you're, yes, that, that's correct. It will add uh, implications into the process, um, and these are the matters that we're raising this month. You may be further in the oncoming months, and we're constantly reviewing um, that. But yes, this this matter will will impact the delivery. Um, we can have more meetings, but we have. Only got so many staff and so many consultants who can do yep, so many hours. Counsel, and, and so I appreciate you guys already will, be under the pump. But we will try as, as and yeah. achieve as much as we can. I guess my question was going to be: if if is there, is there a chance we could, for example, use the next council meeting to, to ratify it, or, or are, we, are we forced to go through the Stratton poll just in terms of the ratification process, not the? Um, Madam Chair, in terms of the. Uh, timing that essentially a deferral to the next committee will buy it. It, it, it looks like six weeks, but on paper it's four. Mm. Yeah. Um, and the timing that I've worked out is basically by next Monday, I'd need to have, uh, building on the conversation we have shortly, other comments from councillors so that we can usefully develop something for potentially a workshop the week of the 17th of 18th of May, yeah. rather than having that workshop cold incorporating things. Uh, Finalisation of the agenda for the next committee occurs the 27th of May and goes out on the 1st of June. So essentially we'll be buying four weeks, but we'd need to have a workshop uh, in the second week so that we can develop responses. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, look, it's frustrating, but nonetheless, it's still a lot faster than the Plum and TC1 process. Yeah. Know, so. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> it's still it's going. Still on <laughs> Thank you, um, Councillor Newbone. Uh, Councillor Tag. Yeah, thanks. I think Stu's um, questions, part, you know, Tracy's response, partly answered. 
my concern, but I suppose, Tracy, my question is, is the shortening of the time frame, is that relating to sort of statutory time frames? Um, you know, we have a certain number of weeks to go out. Um, is that the real constraint um, or is it possible we could, um, you know, is there any room to shorten those time frames in terms of the consultation and so on um, to get it over the line, the street yeah. training? Through you, Madam Chair, they're not statutory time frames. There is one statutory time frame within that, and that is the development of a plan that must go out in accordance with Clause 4A of Schedule 1 to Iwi prior to notification. Right. So it will impact our ability to do that. Um, and we've, we've sought legal advice on that, and you cannot run the process concurrent, which is trying to build efficiencies into the system. We had hoped to do that, and legal advice said they must run consecutive. So put a full stop on a draft as near close to no proposed plan as possible, and then consult with EWI. So this movement will impact that. So that is the only statutory requirement up until the process of notification, and we must give EWI sufficient time to have digested that document and fed back to us, oh. and staff bring those comments back to council. So um, ultimately, the time frame is up to us up until the time of notification of the plan. I'm just wondering whether there's any any room to shorten the notification to some of the other stakeholders other than Iwi. That wouldn't be my recommendation. And if, that, um, if that meant the difference between us getting it through this training or not, that's yeah, something I'd be keen to Look, um, through you, Madam Chair, there are lots of movable parts. Um, post the meeting today, I was going to sit down with the team and we've already got people working up a couple of scenarios for us. Um, the trajectory that we were on was pretty tight anyway. Um, we've had the curse of COVID and it's not an excuse, it's been a reality. So being able to engage with people to the depth and how we want to has, has really encumbered us. So we are, we are any, any day <laughs> that we um, lose has, has impacts. So we've got people working on scenarios. Um, I would like to give you the confidence, confidence to say we can get it to you, but I don't believe we can knowing the job that we've got in front of us in the next few months. Well, it would be great if those other options could be explored just to see if Madam, this Madam Chair, obviously I've already um, looking at working in a workshop. That is when I'd, I'd probably bring those to councillors so you can appreciate uh, what's left to do and how much time we've got to do it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. All right. So we are... 40 minutes in. <laughs> How about we start? <laughs> All right, David, over to you. Tēnā uh, koutou. Uh, good morning, David Fazakli. Um, thank you, Tracy, for the introduction. Uh, William, I'll just get the first slide up. So we do have just a couple of slides um, and obviously the recommendation from the chair um, sent through yesterday for your consideration. Uh, as Tracy mentioned, we've been on a, a journey I guess that started in 2015 with the idea of reviewing the existing coastal plan, which is over 25 years old. Um, where we're landed now is we've had 13 workshops. Um, we've actually gone out and engaged heavily already uh, with stakeholders, um, with iwi in particular. Um, COVID has impacted some of that engagement. And so some of that engagement is actually ongoing. And the intent was that we would overlap our engagement on the draft plan and bring you back a version of the plan which can then be debated and discussed. So once we get all that actual written feedback, so to date we've obviously had a lot of um, informal feedback. We've been taking notes as we take notes um, of all the councillor workshops and the workshops with Councillor Lichwark. Um, that all gets fed into the mix. So um, just next slide there, William. Um, and just in terms of engagement, I guess um, most recently we have uh, had two online community meetings. Again, because of COVID, they've had to be online. Uh, one with the East Coast communities uh, covering Coromandel and Hauraki, and one with the West Coast communities. Uh, we've directed, as a result of those online meetings, which were attended by around about 40 to 60 people each, uh, we've directed people to the online survey, and that survey closed last Friday. So that survey has, again, just given us a little bit of a test 
of the policy direction that went out last year to the community and to stakeholders. Um, that direction, we've had over 200 responses to the survey, uh, and we were going to bring those survey results back to you. Um, as um, the director has said, we are on a very tight time frame here. Um, so the intention was to seek feedback, recognising that our draft isn't a perfect draft. Uh, it is very much um, that 80% draft that we had talked about in workshops. I'd like to think we're closer to 90% now, um, but we do actually want feedback from everyone um, around, I guess, um, the motu, but also around this table. So very much you as the councillors are the decision makers. You as council will make these decisions. Um, the intention with the draft was merely to get it to a stage where you had a level of comfort that we could put it out and, and obtain feedback. Um, just in terms of the next slide, William. Uh, so we have had those hui. Um, so we have been very active um, with Tainui, Maniopoto and Hauraki Iwi. Uh, we've met individually with probably two thirds of the Hauraki Iwi now. Um, we are looking to close the loop on, on the other Iwi. Um, but also recognising that not everyone wants to meet with us. Um, some want to actually see the draft plan and see what the content is to then be able to provide their feedback. Um, engagement, previous engagement, we've fed that in. So in phase one and two of the project back in the end of 19, uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, and then again with phase two, we have gathered all that feedback and we've provided that, and that's been fed into the mix of I guess the draft plan that's um, before you today. Next slide, William. So the intent when the draft plan goes out is that we will engage with our targeted stakeholders. So that's not all stakeholders, but it is stakeholders that we are required to consult with. Waikato Regional Council is required to consult with under Schedule 1 um, of the Resource Management Act. So the intent was to consult with EWI authorities, with local authorities, with central government, and also some of our other statutory agencies like Te Aho Kai Moana and the Hauraki Golf Forum. At the same time, we're also intending to um, do some informal engagement with some of the other stakeholders that we know will be big players, I guess, when it comes to the notification of the plan. So the likes of Forest and Bird, um, the likes of Environmental Defence Society. So we are looking to continue that active period of engagement around that. Um, just in terms of the legal review, which has already been touched on. Um, so that legal review uh, was provided to us um, from Simpson Grierson. Thank you. Um, and the legal review found that the structure, coverage and con content of the draft plan to be appropriate and generally in accordance with the requirements of the RMA. Um, the legal review also confirms that the draft plan gives effect to both the national and regional direction under the RMA, under the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement and the Regional Policy Statement, as well as the vision and strategy for the Waikato River. So from that high-level legal review, we've also received some, some um, detailed feedback, but again, the comprehensive legal review is intended to cover that. So the idea was the version that is before the committee today, would go through that second comprehensive legal review where it looks line by line at all of the provisions. Um, at the same time, we are aware that there are other things in the mix, and we've talked previously around the marine biodiversity protection. Uh, we believe that as a result of the workshops, um, we've landed in a place that the majority of councillors are comfortable with. So that is proposing a policy that would be used as a placeholder or a coat hanger in addition with a method whereby areas that may warrant further marine protection controls under the coastal plan uh, can be included and identified. Some of that science that would support that um, information and decisions will be available later in the year in time for the proposed plan. Uh, but in the meantime, we're suggesting that as part of the draft plan going out, we would also have a two or four page discussion document which would just highlight the options that are available to Council in terms of further marine protection. It would also identify um, a possible uh, area that may be appropriate for further marine protection controls um, and at the same time initiate some informal engagement around those with the same stakeholders.
In terms of um, the national environmental standards, um, Councillor Teg has brought to our attention the High Court decision that was uh, released in November last year. So this was um, pertaining to the Northland Regional Plan Appeals. Uh, and it was between the Minister of Conservation and the Mungafai Protection Society. Uh, as a result, the ruling of the court was that natural wetlands um, exist in the coastal marine area. So the extent to which the national environmental standard applies also applies in the coastal marine area. Uh, the legal advice that was shared with you um, in the last couple of days has suggested three options that are available to council there. Um, so those three options um, are to amend the plan if and when the minister makes amendments to the NES for freshwater. Um, consider through the submissions process making amendments um, or undertake through section 44A of the RMA uh, amendments directly by council into the proposed plan. So all those options are available. Um, the reason why we hadn't highlighted this previously to council is because um, at the moment there is no clarity on exactly what that decision means. Um, in theory, it could mean that all of the coastal marine area is a natural wetland, which then makes it very difficult uh, to do any activities in the coastal marine area. Uh, we have had it confirmed um, as recently as Friday that the Minister is currently considering options to amend the NES for freshwater. Um, and as soon as that decision is made, then we'll have some clarity as to timing and how that fits with our current process. But there will be amendments to the NES for freshwater is what we have heard. So that's kind of some of those uh, matters that are sitting in the background. Um, if we were at the proposed stage, then we would certainly want to have everything locked in and resolved. But because we're at the draft plan stage, the intent is that some of those issues will be resolved concurrently um, while the plan is out there for feedback. Next slide, William. Uh, so this is our, our timeline um, as of uh, two days ago, uh, recognising that it's likely to change. Uh, you would have seen an earlier version of this, so it's essentially the same. Um, the recent workshops obviously feed into today. Um, during that period from uh, mid-June, or starting next Monday, we would send the draft plan out for six weeks of consultation, so six weeks of opportunity for written feedback. Coupled with that, we were having direct engagement HUI, uh, again with iwi authorities, with local authorities, and those targeted stakeholders. Um, part of that is to introduce the plan um, and talk about some of those key issues that stakeholders may have ahead of them providing written feedback. Uh, then during that period, we would analyse that feedback and obviously um, have further workshops with councillors to discuss um, key issues that came about. This is all part of that informal process prior to notification. We were then aiming in September to go to the uh, 7th of September council meeting to get formal approval to, to notify the proposed plan, which is when the formal process kicks in, uh, when we have the submissions process and obviously the hearing committee um, make recommendations to council uh, on any submissions and any other matters. Uh, so that, that's our current time frame. Um, just in terms of, I guess, where we're up to now, Tracy, and would you like to just talk to the next slide, William? Yeah, William, if you could pop the next slide. Up. So, councillors, here is the amendment to the recommendation. Uh, well, actually, it, it is a, a new recommendation that would uh, make the one in the pack null and void. Um, so, the receipt of the report that the decision uh, is deferred to the June meeting to enable further refinement of the draft plan and to address more fully the matters councillors have raised. Um, and that the council workshop or shops, depending how we go, Madam Chair, uh, be scheduled in advance of the June meeting. As I've said, I've already done some, some preliminary work on when some of those dates could be. Um, and provide opportunity for further briefings on. And these are the matters that um, I've captured that I believe council to date have indicated a, a willingness to understand deeper. Uh, David's outlined the National Environmental Standard on fresh water, so should Council want more detail on that? And we also have Brent here, who um, has been the director who has grabbed uh, the misalignment or the, the challenge that MEP has presented to us in that regard. Um, understanding the different uh, classes of significance ascribed to the estuaries of the region, 
I think that's something that councillors would like to understand better than any other matters that may be identified today. And Madam Chair, I would reiterate, to really get the most out of the workshop, I would really like to um, secure from councillors today those matters that are outstanding, if not today, by the end of the day on Monday, because that then gives an opportunity for us to be prepared, send you the workshop papers in advance of the workshop, the hopefully the following week. So we are not just talking about issues that, that are popping up as we drive in. There may be some of those. Um, I think it would be more beneficial if we had, um, as we have in the um, emails that we've received thus far, an identification of what those issues may be. Thank you, David. Um, and Madam Chair, just to reiterate, the, the timeline that David put up, it will all be picked up and moved. Um, councillors may ask questions about the six weeks for engagement on the draft. Look, anything less than that to me doesn't constitute genuine engagement and we will be criticised and we won't achieve really the positive engagement we're looking for. Um, similarly, we don't know what will happen in the um, Omicron or new variant space. So for us, six weeks was a, a good period of time. Thank you. All right. So is that everything in your presentation? So you're happy to, to take any um, questions? So, so we'll start with just questions. Um, if, you, if you need some additional information, either um, uh, from Brent or, or David or whoever else, else has all the answers. Uh, and, then, and then we'll do the, the whip around, all right? So we will start with um, Councillor Remington. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, David, thanks for the uh, presentation. Um, the question I have is um, in regard to forming of this draft, and uh, you seem to have a lot of kind of emphasis, and rightly so, because it's mandatory, on Schedule 1 and into, with the RMA. And uh, it's part of the our treaty obligations more than that. It's just the right way to do business with Eby and Forest Bird. My question is, how much consultation have you undertaken in regard to the likes of the fishing clubs? Now, example, of, I'm sure you have. Well, like Raglan, for instance, I, you know, I've had a councillor who's already been on radio saying, you know, they're going to oppose this, this, and this. I mean, absolutely outrageous in my opinion. So it's important to my, for my view, that you've actually encompassed these large fishing clubs that are particularly in the Coromandel, but also in the likes of the uh, of, the, of Raglan Harbour, um, because we're better off to have it, in my opinion, included rather than trying to do it retrospectively, because it's very difficult to get any change in my experience uh, in, in documents. You, you tweet it, but really there's not big changes, but it really got to be representative of the people of this country rather than just uh, the uh, conservationists. That's my view. Um, so I want to make certain that you have actually gone out and actually uh, sought uh, groups, uh, recreational users, on how they could perhaps use these wonderful facilities better. And the second is the industry groups as well. Um, I, like visit to Aotea, then I think personally, there's great opportunities for mussel and um, oyster farming. There's small operations there now, but uh, what uh, kind of uh, industry groups have you spoken to in, uh, in, in particularly the West Coast? I call it the Cinderella. Of the uh, of this whole kind of group of it, and I was a rep there as much to blame as anyone else. But I just feel the West Coast harbours have been perhaps not as well um, uh, represented, or we haven't really taken as much notice as I would have liked to have, uh, uh, put into it. That's two questions. How broad the questions? Uh, one is the recreational. One is the uh, industry groups. Madam Chair, if I can just perhaps lead off because uh, I have a bit more history, uh, David came on board to help us out last year. Uh, prior to that, at our probably our third workshop with council, we asked councillors to provide us with uh, an email of people who perhaps we hadn't captured. And we've been uh, making sure that that email list, the people on that list, have been kept informed uh, of what is happening on our website and developments. Um, they can also subscribe to website updates. Now, at the time, we were provided a very comprehensive list 
uh, of those folk on the west coast um, and took some time with with Councillor Littorak to get that list right. So in terms of have those people been contacted? Yes, they have. They've been kept informed of the plan and made aware of when opportunities to input have existed. Um, we were also furnished with uh, our list for the East Coast was seen to be a bit deficient. So um, Councillor Teg helped us out and Councillor uh, Hodge also helped us out with additional names that should have been part of that. Now, admittedly, that was two to three years ago, and we have built and grown that list as, as councillors are identifying people who, um, who I guess their visibility has grown in the community. So I just wanted to give that, that bit of backstory as that's information David hasn't been privy to. Um, the next piece was just on the... Just reiterating, as we've done in the workshops, that the draft document that we are looking to take out is a draft document to targeted stakeholders and partners. It is not the wider public. Uh, that would, uh, if council was of a mind to do that, that would add significant uh, additional resource that we don't have planned within the project and time. So this, this is what we've always put before councillors, both as part of this long-term plan business case and the previous. Um, David, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything further. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to make it easier. Oh, just uh, thanks for that, uh, Madam Chair and Tracy. Well, I'm just saying, hey, for heaven's sake, just don't just make it uh, in regard to the mandatory schedule one. Keep it broad. Look at recreation. Look at those, uh, particularly fishing clubs. There's probably six, seven of them. Some of them have got over 2,000 members. It's important you balance and you go to with this to the public with an open mind. Also the industry groups as well and to try and encourage them. David, just... Can I get you to just leave your mic on all the time? Otherwise, you get out of the sink and, and I can't go to you for an answer. So just leave that on. Did you want to make a comment? Yes, just, just to add to um, what the director said. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we haven't gone out and consulted directly with the fishing clubs. Um, what we have done is obviously ensure they were part of the stakeholder list in terms of earlier engagement um, and then more recently, the, the public meetings. So everyone that was on those early lists was invited to the two public meetings that were held on the 11th and 12th of April. Um, and as I said, we'll bring back the survey results of that. Um, a lot of that initial phase was around information gathering. So what are the issues? And then can the coastal plan actually address that issue and how should it address that issue? So that was the intent of the policy directions papers um, last year uh, when they were released in April, May, was to get that feedback around the direction that Council intended to take with the draft plan uh, and to ensure that was, um, I guess, fed into um, the plan that's in front of you today. I think whether um, Council takes um, additional marine protection options, maybe where in particular the fishing industry groups um, would likely want to have a say. Um, and I think that's uh, a matter that within the current timeframes, um, we are limited um, to those Schedule 1 statutory parties. But that's not to say that um, other feedback and other opportunities such as those online meetings um, can't occur. Uh, and then just in terms of um, the industry groups, uh, so we have been consulting um, with uh, the likes of the Coromandel Marine Farmers Association and Aquaculture New Zealand. Uh, we have had feedback from the marine farmers in the West Coast, um, particularly Kafia, um, and some of that um, obviously um, issues are potentially in conflict with other feedback that we've received in terms of how our harbours and estuaries uh, may, may be used in the future under the plan. Yeah, but <laughs> All right, uh, so just so um, everybody's clear on the speaking order, I've got um, Councillor Kneebone, Councillor McPherson, Councillor Mahuta, and then Councillor White. That's the order of uh, Councillor Tegg in there. Thanks. Uh, so, Councillor Newbart. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, look, thanks, David. I, I, I note your um, the vibes you're getting that, that there may be some amendments to the NES. Conceptually, if if that didn't happen, 
would it be fair to say that we're going to consult on a whole bunch of stuff that could effectively be completely un, under overwritten by by the NES to all intents and purposes? That makes sense because because um, yeah, that that would um, be a frustrating process if that was the outcome. Yeah. Yes, just just quickly through you, Madam Chair. Yes, that would that would be the case, and I guess that is staff's concern if we did a whole lot of work as a result of the High Court decision, and then um, it gets changed by the Minister three months later. So that's why we're in a wait and see position at the moment, and we believe that between now and the proposed plan, we have that opportunity to make any amendments um, as a result of the direction that the Minister takes. Oh, oh, I guess it just... Um... Sorry, I, um, we've got um, uh, people online, so... I do have, if, if everything's in their lights off, I do have the speaking order recorded, so. Um, I, I guess I'm obviously, we've all got the um, the month's extension in the back of our minds, and that it seems to me that may well play out in our favour in terms of trying to minimise the um, the likelihood of a whole lot of stakeholders doing a whole bunch of plumbing work, but, but I, I appreciate that's a, that's a bit of an unknown. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. All right, uh, Councillor McPherson. Hang on. So, Madam Chair, are you wanting specific comments in relation to the draft plan? Oh, yeah. That's just... oh. <laughs> We're going to be here for three hours if we don't, so I'll um, go. Okay, so can I just ask, in the June workshop, will we be able... Is it... Possible. Sorry, May workshop. No, but you, yeah, we've got a, a May workshop, and then there was a it set up on one of your slides that will be a June workshop as well. I saw. So the sorry, the June workshop would be post the feedback from going out to the targeted stakeholders that we would bring back to councillors. Okay. So, so if you pick June up, it's likely to be July. Okay. So does that mean that if, if we as councillors hear feedback from stakeholders that we think, oh, yeah, um, we, we want to have an, a view on that or we want to massage it or accept or reject, can we, can, do we get that chance? Or once, the, once they've made their, they've given us their feedback, we just have to adopt that? Uh, the answer, Madam Chair, is most definitely. So this document that we've got now remains in draft right up until we get the decision from council to notify the plan. So even the document that we will take out to EWI in advance of uh, notification of the plan yeah. will still be a draft document that is able to be changed. Yeah. So definitely once we have undertaken our targeted consultation, as David said, we will bring that back to council and council still has the opportunity to, to test and probe and alter the plan at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, um, your comment on marine biodiversity protection, um, I guess that's, I, I'm looking for um, comfort that, that we've explored every option available in this plan to um, apply the learnings from the Motiti decision. And because my read is that we've been quite timid in relation to that. And um, my, my impression is that um, you and the staff have taken the view that there's a paucity of science, so therefore we can't use the Motiti decision to say that there are environmental benefits, for example, of not allowing dredging um, around the islands of the Northern Gulf, even though citizen science tells you that fishery has absolutely collapsed. Um, so that would be, uh, that's one of the things um, that I'm, um, I think we're being quite timid um, to councillor uh, to chair Remington's view um, in terms of fishing clubs um, uh, those people in fishing clubs that view it as their right to drag steel around the ocean to catch mollusks um, I, you know I think that we've got a once in a lifetime opportunity to draw a line in the sand to say no we, we don't want that um, 
I've given you photos and I've shared with Director May photos of hard structures where I think this plan would really help us. Kōpū Tōaki and the Urupā there, where we've seen poor use of hard structure. Um, but if, if the iwi come to us and say um, that we want um, to use hard structure to protect that Urupā, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that this plan is written in such a way that that it will enable that. And I and I think about the other photo I sent you of the road frontage at Waititi Bay, where our road is going to be undermined by the next uh, one in 50 year um, storm event. And the community wants to see action. And I suspect TCDC is sitting there waiting for how are we going to react in this um, planning document. Um, the Tracy, you've asked for all the issues to be given to you by close of play today or tomorrow, or uh, and I absolutely, I absolutely sympathise with that. But as late as last Friday, I heard Councillor Lichwark give you um, some feedback on um, hovercrafts and flying at all, and it was such a that was a sort of a turn on light moment for me. I didn't understand. You know, for example, what was going in Whangaroa in relation to that benthic disturbance, and so um, I'm just hoping that that before um, your drop dead line um, for final um, inputs, I mean, what, what what we're having to do is go and talk to um, uh, Councillor Litchwark and, and get his views and form those into a question and, and come back to you. So hopefully we'll have time to do that. David, in terms of the court decision, um, I, I kind of feel like um, as a group of governors, you should have taken us on the journey. Um, I know it's complex and, and I know it's the, it's got risk written all over it for the plan, but I'm kind of feeling um, that over the weekend, I've had a number of conversations with a range of people to try and really understand what's going on with that. So if there are any other issues where you, you've got a view that um, it's too complicated or there's too many unknowns, I won't go near the council with it. I'd, I'd really like um, to be taken on that journey. But, so those, Madam Chair, would be my um, opening comments and questions. Thank you. Now we've got uh, Councilor Mahuka. Oh, yeah. um, firstly, really appreciate all the mahi that's been done. Um, that there's 60 pages to look at is an admirable task. It's bringing together where we're up to right now. Having said over the plan change, admit, um, 16 sounds like a lot of hui, but we had way more for PC1, so count yourselves lucky. Um, <laughs> More in, more in chambers, more out of chambers, opinions of everything. So I don't, that's in, but that's exciting. That means our community are engaged. Probably just the, um, and having talked to staff about the, um, again, Māori mana whenua and other inputs, um, just a couple on the document. I think we're a bit beyond now in Aotearoa 2022, having to explain who Māori are in terms of the tangata whenua chapter. I think if you've got to say all of this now, 20 years after the last plan, then we really haven't had treaty settlements and the whole dumb debate about co-governance and all of that. So I just think it's a rewrite to say where we are right now. That's where how they used to talk about us in the 70s when they used to say the Māori is <laughs> natural state. We're not there anymore, whānau. So just encourage us to change it um, because we have now a an, an, an next generation of Māori who are part of our planning cycle. I think that's what we should speak to. Uh, bit of uh, bit of mixing thing, but I've learned having listened to you all in the um, treaty wānanga that we go from Māori to tangata whenua to iwi hapu. It's not um, it's not cognizant for most non-Māori anyway, so you may as well explain it better. Tangata whenua is any Māori in New Zealand. Mana whenua is Māori who are from the place they live in New Zealand, and I think that's who we mean when we're going looking for iwi endorsement and that we're not asking any Māori we're asking for the Māori in this region so that whole page and a half I, I can help but I just think it can be more efficient and I'll in the New Zealand we live in today now if that's required a statute I'd rather it be a um, appendix a very poor and weak one and we say how with the Waikato region and it's here we are now because we are that, that sounds like the old one hey 
couple of quick ones after that. Um, so just wondering if the, because um, we we defer to iwi because they're an easy group to get to, right? But given that in the west coast, most of the, there are 20 MECA application, applicants on the west coast and 40 on the east coast. So if we haven't talked to those 60, um, and they're mainly hapu, they're not iwi applicants. So these are, yeah, um, Māori claims to the coastal space. So there's 60 of those in Aotearoa here at the moment. So I just want to make sure that that group is on, or someone from, or representatives of them. Otherwise, we'll never know what they think about our coastal plan. And then, um, Mac is oh, marae-based aquaculture. I don't know what that is. Um, most of us don't actively manage the aquaculture and the marine environment, manage the fisheries. So I, I don't know if that's a useful subset unless you can draw it down off another act because it's creating a new thing. And I give the example, Mamarais and Huntley, we have customary fishing light rights out of Kaiawa that we can exercise twice a season. Now that's between us and Ngati Pawa over there and it's been in place for a couple of hundred years since they left us. Um, we don't, it's a tribal understanding but we protect that fishery with them. But we're not marae based aquaculture people. But under the definition, we might fit. And so, again, just don't want to create confusion where we don't need it. And just in terms of um, token for inshore fisheries, that's all managed by iwi. So I don't know if it's a double up or a double conversation with them, if that helps. And then just a practical one, could you go to the slide that's the process and the time? Thank you. Sorry, um, I just, uh, mm. sorry Councillor Mahito, I didn't capture your last bullet point uh, around... The inshore fisheries. Inshore fisheries. Uh, yeah. uh, he, he mentioned token as a group to right. consult with, yep. but all inshore fisheries are iwi prop. Yeah, right. iwi provenance. Understood. So token won't be able to tell you how they're doing it in Carthia, they'll just tell you who holds the quota. Yep. And actually the bigger, better quota is over Hauraki, so worry about that one. Um, one, slide, <laughs> one slide back. One slide back, please, mate. So the how are we going to get there? Um, and respectfully, I think staff can do whatever we ask of them as long as we're clear how we're going to get there, because a lot of this is a governance decision. So where are we holding out on? We've all inputted to date and, and some members are holding out on just clarification and information and input so that they can have confidence in this plan. How do we achieve that between now and the next council or policy and strategy committee so that we can land on this timeline with staff? That's the conversation I think we need to have just as councillors. I don't think you can help Tracy Ma. That's just us and our own tikanga as council. And so one of the offers was we have an informal workshop that's not counted in council rules so that we as councillors can be clear that we included Councillor Lichuak's view and out so that we understand where it's coming from. And notwithstanding, full reports can be written, but he won't be there to ask <laughs> um, or pick on me or whatever. So that's one way. The other way is we could go through a whole lot of writing up things to have input. Um, but I, what, whatever happens, it's, it's some, and then one more structured workshop so we're, that we're clear we're at everybody's end thing before we go to final. So my, my suggestion is, is that in the next two weeks we do that. We have one formal workshop, oh, an informal workshop. If council rules are going to stop us from meeting with council work, happy to do it outside of council rules. Secondly, that we have a formal one to formalise that feedback so that it can, so that by the next time we see it. We are at penultimate. So just trying to help the decision making, because I think, a bit like Councillor Remington, that if we lose the opportunity to do that last part, to notify, um, it'll be extra delayed in a new term. It wouldn't happen till the middle of the first year, from my experience with PC1. <laughs> um, so we owe it to ourselves as councillors and our commitment to this council and to the coastal communities to move with haste, but properly. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. I just wanted to add that now while I had the mic, and that's probably me for the day. Kia ora. Yeah.
Um, just, Madam Chair, I just wonder if I could just touch on those earlier questions, um, obviously not the, the last part around the, the governance matter. Um, so in terms of the structure of the plan and the reason why we've got the Tamata Whenua chapter um, is because the national planning standards say we have to have that chapter and it has to have these things in it. Um, and I think that's where we want to now provide that, that chapter and that content out to the iwi authorities to say, well, is this right? Is this, is this where we've landed? So we have had input from the Tairanga Whenua team. Uh, and one of the questions that was asked was, uh, we can call it Tamata Whenua chapter or Mana Whenua. Um, at the moment, we've just said Tonga Whenua, but um, that's easily changed. Um, in terms of the MACA applicants, yes, we haven't touched base with all of them. Um, certainly, we've got a, a good process with Mania Poto in terms of um, an upcoming workshop, uh, Wananga, um, with all the RMC reps. Um, so we've got a process in place for them, but that same process um, is a little bit different in the rest of, in the, rest of the region. Um, and certainly take on board the fact that uh, Te Aho Kaimoana um, are only in terms of the allocation of, um, you know, crown crown assets to Iwi. Um, so there is a, a much richer conversation there. Um, I am conscious that also um, the issues that do get raised um, through through Hui and through engagement that we've had um, aren't necessarily about the coastal plan. And so we need to quite often find mechanisms on how we how we can perhaps um, add value to those those other conversations and those other processes. But no, thank you. That's very valuable feedback. Uh, Councillor White. Thank you. Yeah. Um, other people have raised some things that I was, was interested in too, so I won't raise those. I'll just um, raise the things that, that I, I would like um, answers on and just make a few comments. Um, I did agree with what, uh, with what Councillor McPherson said about us being quite timid in the area around um, dredging. Uh, and I, I do have a question around that, but um, I also had a comment that I'd, I'd actually prefer there to be restrictions in the plan rather than just a summary discussion document outlining options such as limiting bottom trawling, dredging activities and marine dumping. I personally think we'd be better to actually start off with, um, with restrictions and then actually allow people to make comment and amend, amend from that rather than actually just provide um, options to people. But I just wanted to ask a question around the word um, avoid, the legal definition of the word avoid, because I saw in there that it talks about avoiding disturbance of the seabed in vulnerable ecological areas. Um, and my understanding of the word avoid is a little bit like what I said in a previous um, meeting about the words where practicable. I thought that the word avoid was, well, try to avoid it, but... Um, but if you you can't avoid it, then so so what I want to understand is exactly what you understand from the word avoid. I think we have had a session where we talked about this, but I obviously don't have it completely fixed in my head because I didn't feel like that there was enough protection there in terms of trawling, dredging, and marine dumping. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, so it's so avoid is is absolute. Um, the King Salmon decision. Okay. of the Supreme Court um, that determined that avoid means avoid. Um, so that means avoid all, all effects. Um, in terms of that context, how we've worded it, um, the intention is that those vulnerable communities or marine habitats need to be identified, and then you would implement controls that would ensure that effects are avoided. Um, and so I guess that's the, the question where from the previous workshop, um, we're suggesting that we engage alongside the draft plan on areas that may be appropriate um, and controls that may be appropriate and then bring that feedback back to you um, around this table to to make a decision. Um, I know there is a variety of views on this particular topic, um, so it wasn't to kind of make a decision here and now. It was essentially to enable staff to gather feedback to then come back to you um, and then seek that formal decision. Good. All right. Uh, Councillor Tegg, just a speaking order, we've got Councillor Tegg, uh, Councillor Quayle, and then Councillor Nicholl. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to preface my remarks, I think this has been overall a really great process. I mean, I've really appreciated the workshops, um, and I've really appreciated the one-on-one -on -one I had with David and across recently, because I think that was the most productive part of the 
whole process for me. Um, and you know that was that was um, you know one on one where you could really get to the nitty gritty of what your concerns were. So overall, that's great. Um, but this this issue around the um, wetlands, the um, <coughs> environmental standards has thrown me a bit. Um, um, and I don't want to get into the merits of that argument, but just the process. And for me, um, as a point of principle, uh, we had letters from staff to the Ministry for the Environment in December and again in March, which took a position that this council was opposed outright to that happening. In other words, they wanted uh, the coastal marine area to be excluded from those regulations. And it seems to me that... And, and the letter itself talked about this being a significant issue. And to me, that was a, a matter of, you know, clearly a matter of policy rather than technical detail. And therefore, to me, that is something which should, should have come to us as councillors before that, that sort of stance was taken. I, I can understand there are technical issues and, you know, will it apply to this activity or that activity? Uh, but even there, I think we should have, should have been kept informed that process, um, kept in the loop. So, um, you know, I, I do have some concerns around that, and um, I'm really pleased that the chair's agreed we have a further briefing and we can come to grips with that more because I think, you know, it's, I suppose it's not too late for us to have that briefing. Um, but overall, I do, I do have some serious concerns around the way the process around that, that was handled. Um, this has been raised by a couple. I've got a bit of a, a checklist here. I'll try and get through the most. Um, so um, there's mention in the in the staff paper about a summary paper relating to protected areas, and I agree with Kathy's point. Uh, you know, um, we don't even know what's in that paper yet, and and so I suppose we, we should see that at the briefing. But as a point of principle, um, I I believe it's it's better to actually go out there and front up on these issues and say, we, we, we make a determination on this, this and this, and then see what the public feedback on, on it is, rather than sort of be a bit, as to use um, Andrew's word, a bit timid on it. Um, so that applies across all those areas that have been mentioned. But the one in particular I, I think I'm most concerned about is we haven't had the courage to say that we could protect at least one area. And I, I go back to our previous uh, workshop where I asked the question of, of uh, Michael Townsend relating to the Mercury Islands and he, he told us as a group that there was compelling evidence that that should be a protected area. Now there may be still some research to come on that but it seems to me that's, that is an area where we could put a line in the sand and say this is one area at least where we, we go out to the public and say should be protected in some form. So that's a, that's another area I'd like to see discussed at this um, at this upcoming uh, briefing and workshop. Um, and then some other sort of more minor er um, issues. I have some concern. And I think Kathy shares this. You know about weasel subjective weasel words and subjective words. So can we go through the plan and just make sure we've we've um, you know knocked those out and put something that's a bit has a bit more teeth to it. Um, the other, the other um, sort of feedback I've had, um, and it came through in my discussions with David and Chris, was that um, because we've we've got this legal opinion and drawn this arbitrary line on the coastal marine area, and said that we can't deal with sort of the impact of what happens on the land into the coastal marine area, and that even flowed through into the natural hazard section, surprisingly enough. Um, you know, when I suggested some changes there. So have we actually got that right? I mean, if we've got that wrong, um, that could be a really um, serious issue for us going forward. And I know we've got a legal opinion, but it just seems to me in terms of integrated management that it just doesn't make any sense that you, you know, you cut off what ha happens on the land from what happens on the coast. So, so I'd raise that issue. Um, and then um, in terms of the non statutory statutory stakeholders. Um, I think, frankly, if Federated Farmers is in there as one of those stakeholders, and I accept they have some minor interest, you know, 
for the stock exclusion areas, but I'm not aware of any dairy farms below the high water mark. Um, so, you know, maybe if if they're to be included, then a group like Greenpeace and Legacy should also, and I see they left off the list. Um, so I make that point. Um, and then um, in terms of uh, the briefing in terms, so on and I really support Tipper's point that we really need to get Fred around the table. Um, if we can do that through the process she outlined, I'd, I'd support that. Because whilst he's been able to make his views known to staff, we haven't had the benefit of that uh, debate and engagement as, as a council. So I, th I think that's what's missing. And then just a, finally a general comment. Um, whilst we did have a lot of workshops, um, I think where the process fell down a bit is that we're left with just one week to comment on the actual plan. And so I would have preferred to maybe had one or two less workshops and more time to actually discuss the plan itself. And I think that's why we're now seeking a deferral because we didn't have enough time uh, in that period between the workshops and the sign off of the draft. So just a note for Chris and directors going forward that I think we need to do that better in the future. Yeah. Thanks, All right, uh, we've got Councillor Quayle, then Councillor Nicol, then Councillor Husband. Councillor yeah. Quayle? Interesting, we have lots of workshops and then we've, you know, get we, we get the criticism right, we haven't got the plan for long enough. You know, there's all these arguments, which, you know, you can argue it's been a long road of consultation in terms of, you know, council involvement, I mean. So we've had that, um, and I've wrestled myself when you talk about whether it's timid uh, in terms of um, uh, setting out a position or offering options, I think that um, if you just put forward a view and not options, you could create the view that, oh, you know, council's got a closed mind on that. So uh, I see there is a benefit in offering um, options uh, and open to considering views and feedback. So that's quite important to me. You know, it's can't, you can't just say you're timid, uh, therefore we want to define one option. Uh, I do acknowledge all the feedback and the significant work that's gone into to date. I think there's been a huge amount of work uh, and I think that's absolutely appropriate. Um, the, the inputs to the draft were Let's face it, um, we're not going to get a perfect draft out there for people to consider that everybody is happy with. Um, so I'm happy with the timeline. I agree with the need to have some briefings. I agree with Councillor Teg that we need some briefings around those additional uh, matters. So but I think we can still keep to that timeline. I think the timeline can be followed. So I have that pragmatic view that there's been a huge amount of work. Um, we need to move with it. And I think putting the draft out there is not a closed shop. It's part of the process. Um, so that's where I'm at that, um, you know, if we just go on this, treadmill we will never get off it for many months um, so that's where I'm at thanks chair thank you councillor Quayle uh, councillor Nicol thank you chair um, I've got five points I'll try and go through them pretty quick so that we're not here forever um, first point is in regards to the NES and fresh water and applying in the CMA I, my main feedback is I really think it's something that we should have had a heads up on to understand. Um, the second point was, um, I want to second what, what uh, Tipper was talking about in regards to having that um, opportunity to um, bounce off uh, Councillor Littrois' Littrois thinking um, through an informal workshop or, or not, or however, um, and that notification really 
I also desire to have happen in September at the latest. Uh, so happy to help on how we meet that timeline um, with creative thinking. The third point was um, we talk about dredging, but I haven't seen trawling mentioned so much. I'm really keen to understand the distinction um, as it applies in the plan and the activities that will be allowed and not allowed. I haven't quite gotten across that fully yet. Um, and fourth point was I really do want to advocate as well for that concept of the fact that there are areas that are unique and uh, rich in biodiversity. And so if they once were, and it's in our power in any way to restore them to that with the rules that we set, um, then I think we should be bold to do so because it's quite dire out there um, in some places. And ultimately, these are our rules. And I understand the concept of um, having a standard to try and be as consistent as possible, such, you know, the RPS um, from 2016 that we want to adhere to. But if, if it is not illegal to go harder, I'm saying it is my desire to go harder. And as Kathy has said, and as Dennis has said, and I think others have said as well, I'd rather we go harder and have people argue backwards on what the exceptions should be rather than um, the free-for-all that has been the way that it has been for, for several decades um, in, in many respects. Uh, and hence the learning that we've had over the two decades should be that um, we need to do much better. Um, and so I think it is on those parties to bring us those exceptions um, so that that can work for them. And then with in regard, I think Kathy also mentioned this, um, we talk about in the report around this um, summary document, and it has this word in there of talking to um, stakeholders and interested parties about whether to um, protect biodiversity with these specific sites. And, and I would think that we're at a point where we can, as a council, decide that we either do or don't do that. And it's more of a question of when. Um, I don't want to go out and ask the community on whether to do it. I'd like to ask them how to do it. Um, but that's just my point of view, and others have had their say on it too. So that's the five points. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. I've been a little bit quiet on this because I'm not a user of the golf and I don't really have an opinion either way on it. So, but um, happy to go in, like Jennifer said and others have said, um, hard with regulations um, and uh, work backwards from there. It seems, seems a smart thing to do as long as there's a six week engagement. Um, but the um, um, the thing I'm interested in, uh, it comes from the emails that have been bantering around over the last few days, especially is the estuaries and things like that. I don't know if we've been strong enough on that. It's, um, farmers have done a massive job planting, fencing and cleaning up waterways. Um, no matter what the hoo-ha is, the problem now is, besides our little gold friends, the koi carp, um, is developers, is humans. That's where the problem is. So, um, stop the dredging. Stop the stop the um, the development. Um, some of the some of the pictures that have been sent to us over the nine years um, of developments close to water is just ridiculous. <laughs> it's just a sea of mud, you know, like, and, and brown water going into into the estuaries and into the and the things. So I, I don't know if we've been firm enough um, on those developers. And just for a point of clarification. Federated Farmers is um, a local group of rate paying um, people. They're not dairy far and dairy farmers in particular. They're all um, aspects of farming. So, but they are local. They're not from the Waikato. They're from the local area and they will be rate paying members. Thank you. So they are an appropriate group to um, talk to. Thank you, Councillor Husband. Um, Councillor Strange, would you like to make any comments? Yeah, thank you, Chair. 
Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to the staff for the huge amount of work that they've done on this draft plan so far. Um, I think it's fantastic. Um, and also to you, Chair, and the staff for the extra workshops that you're planning and the slight extension of the draft endorsement. I um, just want to agree with Russ and Tipper as well about the importance of finishing it this, this training. Um, another point would be that as far as possible to ensure it's as aligned with central government policies, but I'm sure staff have got that in hand. Uh, two further points, support Councillor Teg um, and his concerns about the process around the wetlands and the marine area um, in future. Yeah, just a, a little heads up would, would have been good. And lastly, support Kathy, Andrew and Tapa in the importance of gleaning from Councillor Litchwark and his um, investment and knowledge in his area. So yeah, would look forward to a workshop with Fred um, informally to um, bounce ideas off him as well. But thank you, Chair, that's all. Thank you, Councillor Strange. Councillor Verko, would you like to make any comments? Yeah, thanks, uh, Pamela. My only comment is this is a complicated plan that we're going out with, and we've got all the experts at the high level saying what should be in it and shouldn't be in it. Um, we need to, in my opinion, put it out as the draft, uh, widely publicise it and get the people that it actually affects on the ground to look at it, and tell us where it uh, should be changed in any way. So that's my uh, thoughts. Get it out there yeah, before the end of the triennium and see what the good people in the on the ground think about it. Yes. Thank you for that, um, Hugh. Uh, Councillor Hodge, would you like to make any comments? Um, kia ora. Thank you, Chair. Like your husband, I'm an inlander, um, although my iwi presumes they think they owned half of the coast around the whole of New Zealand, but hey, aha, I'm, still in, I'm still an inlander. But there are lots of little bits and pieces that I, I, I before around from a Māori perspective and uh, I see a lot of it has been taken up within there um, and and from from my I guess iwi and Māori perspective is is the kai the water uh, and one of the things we spoke about during water care that I highlighted to to our chair was where they were taking the water from and how it affects the history of, of that area and the food that comes up there that wouldn't uh, would lose some of the water because of the water take. So and, and once again I guess um, mine is allocation. I'm really happy with some of the Māori perspectives in here as an inlander. But of course, you know, Tipa and the rest of them they 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 have a lot more to do with the coast than I do. And I'm happy to see some of the main important parts around Māori is taken care of, like um, the Urupa, the rising and falling of the river, of the, the sea. Climate change is, is important because that's what's, you know, pushing the height and low of our seabed. So if you just have to go to Kiowa and see what it's doing there. And how our waterways are affecting the coast. Thank you, Councillor Hodge. All right, so everybody's had had a fair go. I suppose um, from my point of view, I really uh, I do want to see this out before um, the end of this triennium. That has certainly always been my goal as the as the chair of strategy and policy. Was uh, you know we know that a lot of work, a lot of discussion goes into arriving at a plan that is um, able to be appropriate, or that is at a space where we could um, go out and get the, the feedback that we need. I would like to see that happen this triennium, but I um, uh, am, res am respectful that, that we are a collective of individuals that have different views. Um, and I think that we've had uh, many opportunities to share those. We all know that uh, as, as an individual, we don't always get our particular view reflected, that um, 
you know, that in democracy it is a majority rules. And, and so there, there's always going to be bits where we might go, that could be a little bit stronger or that could be a little bit weaker or this isn't exactly what I wanted. But I think that, um, you know, with the 13 workshops we have had with today's session and, and with the proposed uh, sessions we have between now and the June strategy and policy meeting, I, uh, I feel that there has been adequate, more than adequate opportunities to share views. And so I appreciate everybody's participation. I certainly appreciate um, uh, the staff and, uh, and David, the, the hard work that you have, have put in getting us to this point. I certainly, um, uh, I suppose, uh, concur with uh, Councillor Verko that um, I'd like to get something out, out there because as much as I might think or we as individual counselors might think we have all of the knowledge. Um, there are uh, thousands of, of residents and ratepayers and interested parties throughout our region that will have uh, um, expertise and insight uh, that is valuable for us to take note of. So I look forward to us getting it out there. Tracy. Madam Chair, thank you and, and thank councillors um, for the conversation today. Uh, many of us, David, Bruce, myself and many others who have um, spent a lifetime writing these plans are only to aware once uh, the plans are in black and white in an agenda, uh, we tend to snap people to attention a lot more about the significance and the importance of this and only to aware of that, um, uh, you know, this year it is a culmination of a lot of work, but it's also a heck of a lot of work still to do. <laughs> um, I heard Plan Change One mentioned a couple of times, you know, we're still in this process. Um, we have maintained, you know, the somebody talked about keeping the pedal to the metal. Look, we have done that. We have uh, had a team who is down two or three staff members, so... Um, thankfully, we've had David, who's come in, augmented the team and really helped us. And thank you, councillors, both for your uh, input, but also recognition of the work done to date. I've made notes of the discussion. I don't think I need to go through and reiterate all those. They're pretty comprehensive. Um, after Later on today, we'll get together and map out a way forward, Madam Chair. Um, I will reiterate again to councillors that uh, I appreciate that you will, you will be driving both myself and Chris Hard, and I'll um, ask Chris to just make some closing comments. But I will just say that that September, di that September timeline uh, to secure the notification of the proposed plan this year is going to be a challenge. I do want to be very honest about that. And saying that, we will... Um, as I've said, we will look at scenarios and see what we can do, but we will bring that back to council. I, I, I don't want to let you uh, believe it is achievable. I do want to bring it back to you just so we can understand what those ramifications are. Uh, rest assured, if anybody wants to uh, knock this thing off this trainium, I am one of those, but I'm also really, really clear that my, my duty and the duty of this organisation is to the coast and not a calendar. So um, with that, I'll just pass over to Chris, who might want to say some closing comments, Madam Chair. Thank you, Kia ora. Um, look, I just wanted to say, I, I want to acknowledge the debate that's been had, actually. It's, um, I think the coastal marine area is not only a highly technical space, but it's also a highly emotive space. And we've seen that over over many decades, and as the government's tried to deal with uh, you know, aspects of it as well. So I just want to acknowledge what's been said today. Um, certainly the um, doing the right thing, the run once in a generation opportunity to, to, to make a difference. Um, I've had a lot of uh, debate with uh, Tracy about this in, in recent times. Um, we've, there's a lot of debate between us going behind the scenes. Feedback that's coming in through various channels um, you know, we're pushing staff pretty hard. And at the end of the day, you know, we've got technical experts in this area um, who are giving advice. And uh, and I think if, if we try and line that up with your, what your expectations from a governance perspective are, I, I think you'll end up with a, a good plan to notify. I, I'm also having to um, 
put my mind to what does implementation of this look like in the future? Because it's one thing putting in policies and rules, it's another thing when you've got to implement them. And so, you know, we've got to cast our mind to what that means. And, and I'll be trying to make sure Brent's uh, across that as well. Um, as Tracy said, we'll look at that process that you suggested today to see if we can help in, in that way to tidy things up. But the, the key comment I want to make is I do have a KPI um, on this, which talks about notification by the end of August. And this was talked about at CERC recently. Um, we did get it moved from the end of June. Uh, to the end of August, I'm, I'm hearing the words around here, end of, by the end of triennium. Um, that's a discussion that uh, leads to a discussion we need to have. But having said that, it's a KPI to try and, you know, to try and get, uh, to try and achieve it. Um, doing the right thing is more important than just meeting my KPI timeline. So um, I just wanted to let you know that if that's the, the, the will of council, on that, I'm, I'm more than happy to engage in that discussion. Thanks. Thank you, um, Mr. CEO. Appreciate that. Um, and duly noted for the uh, KPI. I'm sure that all the CERC members have heard it loud and clear. <laughs> all right. So we have a, uh, a different um, recommendation on the screen. Uh, so just so everybody's clear what it is, it's that the report is received, that the decision um, on the uh, plan is deferred to the June meeting of this committee to enable further refinement of the draft plan and to address more fully matters the councillors have raised, and that a councillor workshop or workshops as is necessary or may be necessary are scheduled um, in advance of the June committee meeting to provide an opportunity for further briefings on the uh, NES fresh water and um, the significance ascribed to the estuaries in the region. And Madam Chair, I think C uh, to include and those matters raised during committee discussion. Yep. And that, that saves me having to read them all out. Uh, uh, would someone like to move that? Councillor Niebaum moves. Uh, we got a second. Uh, Councillor McPherson. Um, if I could, oh, ju yes? just in moving, just re-emphasise some of the comments that have been made that um, we have to find a process to get Fred into those workshops. Now, whether that's um, informal and a, a formal one, they're all on the same day for expediency reasons, I, I don't know. But if we don't do that, this extension's kind of got a big question mark over what, what the heck we're doing it, you know, so. Um, and that is yeah. a matter, as I said originally, that is a matter for- um, I absolutely council. respect um, your obligations as chair, um, um, Madam Chair, but, but just need to make that point. Okay, thank you. So we have a mover and a seconder. Do I have all in favor? Anyone opposed? Good stuff, motion passed. All right, uh, it is 1119. Um, I think we'll take a wee break, shall we? Yes. Shall we have a cup of tea? Yes. Nice, we will adjourn the meeting for, sorry, did you want to? Are you popping in right at the end here? No, adjourn the meeting. Adjourn the meeting? The meeting? Great. We'll be back in, um, ten, uh, let's say, uh, 11.30, we will reconvene.